Vice President of the Road Forward PAC, which is the organization that is bringing you these six forums on understanding government. These forums are, we strive to be nonpartisan and nonpolitical in these forums. They're basically all about, all about government, and particularly about local government. Tonight's forum is about public education. Uh, I want you to know that tonight's forum, like all of our forums, are, is being videotaped, and it will be available on public access TV, and uh, if you sign up for notifications uh, for future forums, uh, which there is a sign of yes, sheet going on around, uh, then, and that's all you're signing up for, is just notifications of the forums. When we have uh, the links to our uh, videos, I, I will send out those links to people on our mailing list also, so that you can see them on demand and you can stream them uh, on demand. Uh, and uh, so, uh, if you have missed some of the forums, then you'll have access to all of them through public access. So we're talking tonight about education, and I, I, you often hear people say that public education is the great leveler, the great equalizer in our society, uh, giving people an equal opportunity to gain an education in, in a society that's otherwise has great disparities in terms of wealth and opportunity and social equality. I really, really believe that. And every time I hear it, I think of my great-grandparents on both sides who came to this country seeking refuge from hunger and poverty and war. And because they had access to free public schools in Houston, Texas, they lived a good life. They were able to make a good living for themselves and their families and not just survive, but to actually thrive and become solid citizens. I truly believe that free public education is the foundation of our democracy. I think if you cripple our schools, you cripple our nation. Obviously, I feel very strongly about this. Uh, we were just delighted to have uh, these speakers accept our invitation to speak tonight. Uh, they're, they're public educators, they're leaders in their fields. Uh, they each have had deep experience in the Charlottesville and Albemarle County local schools. And each of them also has broader experience in either statewide organizations, journalism, uh, or other school systems. And so they bring a perspective outside of our community uh, to our community as well. I'm going to ask Madison Cummings to make the introductions. But before we do, I'd like to thank him for sponsoring, also sponsoring tonight's forum. That means basically paying the bills, and we could not bring you these forums without our sponsors, so thank you for that, Madison. He also organized this forum tonight because he is a former member of the Alamore County School Board and um, seems to know everybody in, involved in the school systems. Um, so thank you very much, Madison. The next forums, uh, before I finish, the next two forums coming up are May 25th, a forum on law enforcement and the criminal justice system, and June 8th, uh, a forum on, it sounds very dry, but it's really not, zoning and land use planning and how they shape the world around us. So uh, we welcome you and we appreciate that you're here that your interest and your curiosity about local government have brought you here tonight. And with, with, uh, without further uh, ado, I will have Madison come up and make the introduction. I have a voice that sort of projects, so I'll try to stay away from this. Tell me if I'm hollering too much. Um, since this is Teacher Appreciation Week, or some uh, the end of Teacher Appreciation Week, uh, this is an apt time to do this. Um, thanks to the uh, four professionals who have taken valuable, time, taken valuable time out of their busy lives to enlighten us all tonight. Um, these folks will bring their own unique perspectives <clears throat> on education. Uh, I want to apologize to Kate Acuff, who is the chair of the Albemarle County <clears throat> school board 
Uh, we wanted her to, to have her be here tonight, but she's got a, another pressing engagement. Age engagement. The uh, county schools uh, are having their school board meetings tonight. Um, I guess we'll introduce you, and then you can come up like you know graduation and that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do this in uh, alphabetical order. Robin Bowling is the principal at Greer Elementary School in Albemarle County. Prior to taking her position at Greer, she was principal at Dogwood Elementary School in Fairfax for seven years. Both schools are characterized by high rates of poverty, as well as a rich diversity of cultures and language, languages. She's a regional representative for women education leaders in Virginia, a not-for-profit <laughs> organization affiliated with Curry School at UVA that includes and supports women in all areas of education in Virginia. Uh, John W., this is the first time I've ever called him that. <laughs> John W. Billy Hong became the executive director recently, last summer, of Virginia High School League up on uh, Pantops Mountain, bringing 36 years of education experience and leadership to the Virginia High School League. He worked for 17 years as a classroom teacher and coach in Pulaski with Tazewell, Carolina, and Albemarle County. In Albemarle County, he also served 12 years as an assistant principal, middle and high school principal, and five years as the assistant superintendent for student, student learning before leaving to work at the State Department of Education. For almost two years, Dr. Hahn served the Virginia Department of Education as chief academic officer and assistant superintendent for instruction. And he was the best football coach that Western ever had. <laughs> I don't think so. I, think so. I appreciate you saying that. I hope that. I'm not quite true. Any, any of your successors. Uh, next speaker, Juan Diego Wade, chairs the Charlottesville School Board having been a member of the board since 2006. He's a member of the KTEC Charlottesville Albemarle Technical Ed Center Board and the Thomas Jefferson Adult and Career Education Board. <clears throat> in 2015, he served as president of the Virginia School Boards Association, and in 2013 was a recipient of the John Baker Community Education Award. He received the Mentor of the Year Award from 100 Black Men of Central Virginia, and also as a mentor with the Center for Nonprofit Excellence. Uh, he is an urban planner by profession. Last but not least, <laughs> Brian Wheeler, whom you all know, has been Charlottesville Tomorrow's first executive director, first and only, since 2005. He was a member of the Albemarle County School Board from 2004 to 2010, and after leaving the board, added coverage of local education to Charlottesville Tomorrow's portfolio. The public publication is now the leading provider of in-depth news on our public schools in Central Virginia, as well as transportation and other issues. Brian was previously Chief Information Officer at SNL Financial and a member of the Board of Directors for the Virginia Piedmont Technology Council. <coughs> Prior to his work at SNL, he was employed at the W. Alton Jones Charitable Foundation. We start off. Um, thank you. I think we got some technology stuff straight. I was prepared just in case. I don't trust technology at all, I'm telling you. My name is Juan Diego Wade, and as was introduced, I've been on the city of Charlottesville School Board for 12 years now, and I do this because I love it. It's not for the great pay, um, but um, I did it, you know, I came to the school system. I moved here to Charlottesville. I'm like, I'm leaving this place after a few years after I get some experience, but Charlottesville has a way to kind of draw you in. And I fell in love with this place. I fell in love with it. I started mentoring. As soon as I got here as a, a transportation planner for the county in 91, I did it for many years. I saw many things that I wanted to change. Had opportunities to become on the school board when it was appointed, but I had to make it more difficult and got on when it was a, when it was the first elected school board in 2006. And, and I believe we made some great strides. So what I want to do today, um, I have some handouts and, and you can grab these before you leave and you'll have an opportunity to talk about, I mean to see kind of a general overview of the Charlottesville school system. Today I'm going to talk about some of the diversity in our system and what, what we're doing um, as far as diversity in our particular school district. Okay. So this is kind of a general overview um, in um, um, of the Charlottesville school system, as far as diversity, we, if you know, if you different measures and things, we're ranked number four in the state of the various um, of the most diverse. We have um, about 4,200 students in the district, and I had got, gotten down to about 3,600, 3,700. So we're attracting um, people to 
um, um, the district. Right now we have 34 different languages spoken, and, and as the latest slide you can see, that's almost been as high as 60. Um, just a general overview of the mix. It's about 40% white, 35% black, 11% Hispanic, and um, you can see kind of, and, and I can change, you know, as, you know, with the I, um, IRFMC, if that, you know, if they, you know, if in a year they get kind of a wave of different um, refugees from a different place, that, that, that can change because when they come, when the refugees come in, they come in, um, it's not just one or two families, it's several families to come in. And I can have a big impact on a district that's about 4,200 um, students. Um, let's see, average class size, which is a really a track I was talking with someone today about, I like to tell this story, you know, that I did transportation planning for Albemarle County for nearly 20 years, and I've been through the battles of the Meadow Creek Parkway, the Western Bypass, anyone remember the Western Bypass? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, it was, in, and I was in 91, it was still fresh, and, and so I felt like when I was running for the school board, I was prepared for, you know, I've been at meetings and traffic calming with people with yelled and it's like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I was prepared. And so when I, I thought I was prepared, but I knew that it was a whole different ball game when I became, it was in the first couple of weeks I was um, on the school board. And I was stopping in the parking lot. That does happen. And someone came to me. We had, we were looking at a proposal to increase the class size. We we're about to get into the recession and we we're talking about we need to reduce, increase the class size. And it was going from, I don't know, 17 to 18 or 16 to 17, but it's a really small. And I was like, well, I didn't think that was a big deal. I, I, I was in Richmond and my class size was 32 with one teacher. It was like, what, what are you? And this parent, by the way, she was almost in tears. And I was like, you know, it's, it, I, it'll be fine. It's still pretty small. But I realized at that point that that dealing with a car or being late for work is totally different than dealing with someone's child, their future. And I had to really kind of flip my script, flip, flip my way of thinking that I'm dealing with this person's most valuable commodity. And I just had to, just had to just kind of empathize with that. And my daughter at that time, um, she was four years old. She hadn't started the school system yet. So this is a big deal, this, this class size thing draws a lot of, um, I mean, you, I've been in classrooms now where we might have 17 kids in the class, but that class with, because we don't pull kids out the way we used to, it may have three or four specialists maybe in there working with one-on-one -on -one with children. So we have a lot of attention that we, we give to each um, school, and that, that's a big deal for us. Okay. Um, this here um, talks, looks at the number of, um, the, um, the different number of students that, that we have in, in, the, in the district, so uh, of the different of ESL um, students. So as you see that in 2010, we're at, at 53, now we're at, at 34. But the impact on our budget I wanted to, to share with you is that you can see the change or the increase in the number of teachers and, and students that it is. Right now, so it's about 13, 14 teachers. And we calculate each student lives and ensure you can have it's like eighty or ninety thousand dollars per teacher with benefits and things like that. Um, and so that can have a tremendous impact on one's on one's budget. Um, and and these languages, and we're going to look at it later. They're not, you know, of course we have Spanish, but it's a wide range of languages. Some of them, to be honest, I hadn't I hadn't heard of before. But this is kind of gives you an overview of the last eight years or so of the number of students. And so if you look at 438, that's about 10% of our um, stu student and, and total enrollment. <clears throat> so this is the one that, that always kind of fascinates me as the, the top languages that are spoken in the Charlottesville um, School District. Okay, we, you might expect Spanish, but if you look down to the, the next top um, 10, I mean, the next nine. And so when these students come into our district, if, as you recall with the SOL test, that they don't give, you know, um, the students have to, and sometimes they are very, they're new to 
public education or education in general. They're totally ignorant about you know, books and things like that. And so the way the education works, they give you a year to kind of catch up. And then they treat them just like any other student. And we want that, that challenge, but it takes, takes time. We have to hire staff to, to, with the different languages. And you can see this here shows the, the school and, and, and where they're, they're at. Um, I, so do we want to do questions now or uh, just at the end? Okay, at the end, okay. The next, next slide. So th this is, um, I just, there's a high school student at Charlottesville High School and she's writing a paper, she's a refugee, she's from Nepali in Nepal, and she wanted to information about, well, what are you doing for services and things? And so this, this was something that I shared with her and we talked about of the different services and things that we have in Charlottesville City School as far as, as far as the services that we offer. And we also work with a lot of nonprofits in the community as well for different services, things like in-classroom support. Some of them we do have to, to pull out. If, we can, if you can keep in mind, when you're looking at TV and you see these various refugees camps around the world where they're tent cities and things, some of those um, residents, you know, they come to the United States and they're in our system, they're in our schools, they're in our, um, you know, um, our community now. And, and, and so we have to keep that in mind. And, and these are, you know, this wasn't like a, a place with running water and things like that. Um, and um, so they come here and we provide, not necessarily Charlottesville School, but as a community, we provide services and things for them. So that these are the people that's gonna be taking care of us, they're serving us in restaurants, they're gonna be our future doctors and lawyers um, that's going to be providing services and things for us. So this is um, a slide that shows how much we spend per pupil. And so we have a budget of about $80,000 and right now we spend, and this is for not just city money, but all the funds that we get, and it's about $17,000 per pupil. I know that sounds like a lot in some places, and maybe Southwest Virginia, maybe it's five or six thousand um, dollars per pupil and so um, it's it's a lot but some of you all know that this is a is a wonderful community it's 10 square miles but you could have one neighborhood the average income could be I don't know two hundred thousand dollars another one could be ten thousand dollars it's all in a, a 10 square mile city it's a big difference in in income in services in in experiences and Charlottesville School, we take them all in, and we have to raise the vote of everyone that comes in. And it costs money to do that. Some of our kids come in with a vocabulary of 30, 40, 50,000 words. Others, four or 5,000 words and may not know their colors. That's the differences in the education and the services and things that we have in this community. A lot of things are brought to the front door of public schools, and we have to deal with that before we can even think about educating them hunger, um, uh, maybe it could be mental um, disease or it could be abuse, all these things we have to deal with as educators before we can even think about educating them. But this here, you can look at this, a breakdown of state funds, taxes, and federal, and, and um, we, get, we have a tremendous staff where we have a lot of different grants that we um, write to, um, um, to get um, for various services, but right now it's average about $17,000 for people, and I think that probably puts us in the top five, top 10 in the state. Okay. Let's see. So this is something that we, um, that, you know, if you compare what we offer, that $17,000 um, um, to some private schools um, in the area, it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good bargain. We do have people that pay, about 300 people to actually pay to come into the school system for the different services. Um, that we offer, um, and uh, be, because we, you know, and these families, a lot of them have options to do. They could go to private schools, they could go to other schools, but they choose to come to Charlottesville City Schools because we have been working diligently to put a product on the, um, that not only the residents um, can um, be proud of, but the employers in the community as, as well. I think that's, that's the last one. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of quickly go through that. I've been in these sessions before. At the end of the day, just like, you know, it's a long day, so 
Um, I'll be available to answer some questions at the end, and I'm, uh, I'll yield the floor to the other speakers. Good evening. How are y'all? Good. Um, we've got some local people here. We got uh, had one from the city, got Robin from the county. So I thought I would bring in some of the perspective. Uh, I had two great years at, at now, uh, working at Virginia Department of Education, had some great experiences there. So what I thought I would do is pick out three or four topics that are at the state level, but really do affect uh, local, the local school system. So I thought I'd talk about those. Uh, no way I'll be able to go in depth on all of them. So I'll throw some things out, and then at the end, if you have questions, we'll be glad to answer whatever questions you have uh, along the way. First thing I want to talk about, and I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but uh, the Virginia Department of Education is in the process of creating what they're calling the profile of a learner. Uh, about uh, two years ago, uh, my first year at DOE, we started looking at, we had, well, I saw the term college and career readiness all the time. Kids are college and career ready. Yeah, so what was it? I started looking at it. Well, the SAT people, SAT people said, you got this score, you're college and career ready. And then the ACT people would say this. And the you know, PSAT would have something else. And the Department of Education actually did some work and said, if you get a 500 on your algebra for two SOL, you're college and career ready. Uh, I'm a Hokie. Uh, that came from Virginia Tech, and I have no idea how anybody figured out that if you get a 500 on an Algebra II, they, uh, <laughs> SOL, you're college and career ready. I, I can't, can't even try to justify that. I don't even know where that came from. So anyway, we started doing some work and started looking at this. 26 states had already done something else with defining college and career ready. So we brought in some people from the outside and started working on this. And what we ended up with was called a profile of a learner. And actually, the SOL Innovation Committee, which had been created about the same time I went to DOE, they were working on the same thing. So uh, when they announced their first findings and Department of Instruction, we said, here's what we want to work on. We were actually in the same place, talking about the same thing. Uh, what we realized real quickly was that if you're going to be college and career ready, uh, actually, I wanted to call it career ready because I think college is one of those four or five year things you do and then you have a career for 45 years or 50 years after that, but uh, the higher ed wouldn't let me take the word college out. So here we are with college and career ready still. But what we're doing with the profile of a learner, we went through and said there are other skills that have to make you ready to be prepared for life, not just the test scores along the way. So that's what uh, this is. There are four focus areas here. There's content knowledge, there's workplace skills, community and civic responsibility, career planning. Actually, what this is doing, the State Board of Education is now looking at this and redefining what the diplomas, what the graduation requirements for our, our students will be. Um, let me get this right here. Uh, in 2016, the General Assembly actually passed and Governor McAuliffe signed legislation that's starting with the first time ninth graders in the fall of 2018-19 there will be new requirements for graduation and uh, I'll, I'll go through some of these and they haven't finished all the details but I can give you some ideas about what they're talking about so the first thing uh, hit it one more time yeah content knowledge that's what students need to know that's what we've always measured that's their academic knowledge. How can they apply it? Uh, one of the things in, in this area is they want to have more of a blended approach. Um, SOLs aren't all bad, but it shouldn't be the only measure. Uh, we're talking more about performance tasks and, and those kind of, uh, of, of assessments as well. So we're looking at what are the different ways that we assess students to uh, see, what they, see what they know. Uh, the five C's. Uh, Robin Yerger Helmick always forget some of these. Their communication, they are, um, help me, I'm drawing a blank here. Um, There's a few. There we go. The creative, th creative, critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, communication, citizenship are the five C's. And you're required to have those in there. Uh, that's one of the things that, that, that we're going to measure as far as a graduation requirement. And then connection to real world issues. So there's some pieces there that they want to talk about. Workplace skills. One more time, please. Hit one more. There we go. <laughs> Workplace skills. What we did uh, last spring, and it was very, very interesting, 
in, in, in I guess, January through about, uh, maybe February through about June, we brought in groups of people. But every other week, we brought a new group of people in. Uh, when I say we, it was the DOE staff and uh, the, the State Board of Education. Uh, Dr. Canada uh, was at every one of those. Uh, but we brought in people from college and university. We brought in people from the community colleges. We brought in people from the military. We brought in people from different workplaces. We brought in high-end tech places where uh, you need to have like a four-year degree, a, bachelor, uh, a master's degree to work in. We brought in people that hire people straight out of high school. And we started saying, okay, what is it that the kids really need to have? What are the skills? Uh, that, that they need to have in order to do it. Uh, the, what they talked about, they talked about students being able to demonstrate uh, a productive work ethic, uh, professionalism, being able to be responsible, being able to communicate, uh, demonstrate workplace skills, being able to collaborate, communicate, do those kind of things. So that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out when I say we, uh, DOE is trying to figure out to put into the new graduation requirements and how you measure that. And, and again, that's going to be a little bit iffy along the way because people really like the answer. They, they like, did you pass or did you fail? What's a pass? This is a yes, this is a no. They don't like the gray area in between. And this is going to be a little bit of a gray area along the way about how you're going to measure college and career ready. When did you see the student do this? What, does it, did the kid really do this? So it's going to be a little, bit, uh, a little bit of controversy when we get to there, but it's going to be okay because it's things that we have to do to get kids ready. Yes, ma'am. There we go. Uh, another thing we heard from the people that we brought in is about making connections and involved, be involved in com uh, community through civic engagement. That was really, really big to make sure that students have some civic responsibility, that they understand and demonstrate citizenship, and, and, and they do that. So, so that was really, really big thing that we heard all of the people talk about as well. Uh, show respect for diversity, uh, individuals, groups, cultures. Do that in both your words and your actions. So that was an important uh, piece as well. And then career planning. This is huge. This is huge. There are so many jobs, new jobs out there, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, jobs and employment, uh, but there's so many jobs out there. Getting kids ready, making them aware. We can no longer wait until the ninth or the tenth grade and say, what do you want to do and how do you get ready for it? We need to start talking to students uh, a little bit, even in the elementary schools, they're leaving the fifth grade. Uh, we need to start talking to them a little bit in, in the middle school about becoming aware of the jobs. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, and I'm going to talk about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity in the last five years has gone from what is that to the number of jobs that are available is phenomenal. Uh, all of the medical areas. There's a lot of medical jobs uh, in, in the world out there. Uh, there's a lot of technology jobs uh, just overall. So aligning our programs so that we thought another piece that's important that you're going to see in the new graduation requirements is going to be internships. Have kids get out and go out into the real world and experience what's going on. And when people think about internships, people say, well, you know, in our community, how are we going to have an internship for everything? That doesn't mean that you have to go for a whole semester and be employed and work. So it could be a job shadowing experience. That's an internship. Somebody could go with Robin to work one day. They think they might want to be an educator, be a principal. They could go shadow her for a week. That's an internship. It doesn't have to be that big long-term thing that sometimes we think about as, as an internship. So this is going to be real important uh, as we go through, um, as, as they move through uh, the State uh, Department of Education moves forward with this. Uh, they do want to look at that. One of the things that they want to incorporate into this is to uh, some local performance assessments is what they want to do. They want to reduce the number of credits verified by standard learning tests. They want to start using uh, performance tasks for some of the uh, assessments rather than we want kids to show us what you know instead of repeating what you heard uh, on, on, a, on a test. Increase career exposure, increase internships, 
enter to emphasize the five C's. Okay. Oh, back, back up. Back up. One more. Back up. One more. There we go. Uh, one more. There we go. One of the other things I want to talk about real quickly and mention that, that needs to be on the radar for all school divisions in Virginia is uh, teacher shortages. Teacher shortages, it's, it's a real thing. It's been out there for a long time, um, like in certain areas, but it's even becoming more critical uh, in, in, in all areas. Um, in 2008, there were 719,000, approximately 719,000 teachers in colleges in teacher programs. In 2013-14, that number had dropped to 465,000. That, that's a huge drop. I, I can't believe some of these things that are up here. Uh, special education, we've always struggled with a little bit about having enough special education teachers. Uh, but I've never heard of having a shortage in elementary education teachers. In Southwest Virginia this year, I know at least three superintendents who had to hire people to go teach in elementary classrooms who do not have an elementary certification because they had no application. It's not that he didn't hire the people that were on the list, he had no one on the list. None. Middle school teachers, career and technical education teachers. You can hardly find career and technical education teachers. I think uh, last year, year before last, Virginia Tech had one career and tech education graduate. That was it for the state of Virginia. There was one. Mathematics, unbelievable. Uh, Robin's brother Michael used to be the uh, director for mathematics uh, when I was working at DOE. Enjoyed working with him, but he came to me, uh, I guess two years ago, and said throughout Virginia, he had done a survey, there were 26 math teachers between Virginia Tech, UVA, VCU, ODU, 26 math teachers. That particular year, Fairfax was looking for 34 by themselves. Chesterfield was looking for 18. And that does include everybody else along the way. That's the top five. And now for the second five, school counselors, English teachers. When I was a high school principal at Monticello High School, I could wait until two days before school and hire my English teachers because I had a list of about 10 or 12. I could take care of all my other business first. I could hire the English teachers last because there were many of them and they were all qualified. They were very qualified. Foreign language teachers, it, it's hard to find language teachers. Health and physical education. Who would have ever thought health and physical, there would be a shortage of health and physical. They used to be waiting in line for years to get their turn to get hired to be a physical education teacher. It's not true anymore. Social science, history and social studies, social studies teachers, you never had shortages of social studies teachers. But it's a real thing. So we, we got to pay attention to that. If you look at this map, the reason I'm showing you this map is uh, Charlottesville, Almar County is in the, this region five right here. And if you look, they're, they're the one that only had 29 positions unfilled, that whole region. But what that means is they had 29 classrooms that had a teacher in it that, did, that wasn't qualified or didn't have a teacher license to teach in that area. There was only 29. Look at Region 4, that's your Northern Virginia area. They had 383 positions. Why is that important? Because that's who we compete with. When, we're, when we go to teacher recruiting places to recruit, fairs to recruit teachers, that's who we're recruiting against. I've actually been to the recruiting fair at, at, at Radford University and we couldn't get math teachers to come and talk to us because Fairfax had the checkbook out and literally, if you were a math teacher and signed a contract with Fairfax that day, they would write you a $5,000 signing check. A signing bonus just to sign and come and teach there that day. That's who we're competing with. Yeah, hit it like four times. <laughs> I need to throw out a, dis a disclaimer here a little bit. None of these, well, about three of these slides are mine. My friends at DOE, I called them up and said, here's what I'm doing, can you help me? And I had like four different people send me these slides. I asked Steve Staples, the superintendent, I said, can I use them? Some of them have DOE on them. 
And he said, yeah, you, you, we consider you to be an adjunct uh, employee of DOE. So uh, it was nice of them to give me their stuff uh, along the way. So why do teachers, they actually, uh, we, we did a search, uh, someone did a, 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 a survey. So why do teachers uh, uh, enter and leave teaching? Compensation. It's huge. It, it, it's a big deal. Um, preparation, preparation programs. Uh, they, they feel like they're not getting prepared to go teach the teach in those programs, uh, to go be teachers. <coughs> mentoring induction, they feel like when they go to school divisions, they, they may not get the mentoring or the induction probes. A lot of teachers, when you interview teachers, that's one of the questions they ask. They ask, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'll bet you, I see Robin shaking her head, do you have a mentoring program? If you say no, they're not going to come work for you because they want somebody to mentor them and, and help them along the way. And then teaching conditions. It's hard. Uh, one of the things that I did was at DOE, a quick story that I'll move on here real quick. One of, one of my jobs at DOE was uh, Secretary Holton asked me to go take a task force and start looking at some of the most challenged schools. And there were three school divisions that we went and looked at. And it's hard working in those school divisions. One of the elementary schools the principal told me that the teachers there stay about three years and they leave because emotionally they can't take it anymore because the kids show up at eight o'clock in the morning, they feed them breakfast, then they feed them lunch, then some community group, it may be a church, it may be boys and girls, comes in and feeds the kids supper, helps them with their homework, keeps them there to about 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, then puts them on a bus and takes them back to the projects where they live. And that's what they do. And the teachers emotionally struggle with that because they're going home to their families, to their kids, to their houses, and they know their kids aren't doing that. Almost all of the, uh, one of the places I went and spent a lot of time was in Norfolk City Schools. Almost every elementary school in Norfolk City Schools have washers and dryers. And they hire somebody who washes the kids' clothes for them when they come to school every day. They have a change of clothes for the kids to change to. So it's because they don't have clean clothes, they don't have wash machines and dryers where they live. And, and, and the subdivisions, you know, they're not subdivisions, they're housing section, governmental housing pieces. So it, it's hard, teaching conditions are hard. Real quickly, this was a study, uh, annual average salaries, this came from uh, DOE information. I will tell you, that this was information that was reported on the annual school report. Every superintendent turns one in. These may not be exact numbers because if you remember last winter, remember the state couldn't hold up their end of the 2% salary piece. So these numbers were projected last fall. They may have changed after the whole budget thing happened and the salaries, but they're pretty close. Just to give you an idea. So the annual average salary uh, in Virginia last year for all school divisions was $56,148. Uh, that's what was reported in that report. For Albert County, it was $56,205. Sure, for Charlottesville City, it was $57,509. I can tell you, those are average salaries. They're not starting salaries. I got two daughters who teach at Albert County schools. Both of them have a bachelor's degree, both have a bachelor's degree, and they're not making $50,000. One has five years experience, one has two. Here's why, go back to that map, think about that blue area. <laughs> think about Northern Virginia, that's who we're competing with for teachers, okay? Look at the salaries you're competing against, and, and I handpicked these, I mean, I picked the highest ones. I mean, there's, there's some school divisions up there that have salaries that look like ours. I mean, you know, like ours in our area. There's a few, uh, Culpepper and Falkier, a couple of those have salaries that look less than ours. But these people hire a whole lot of teachers. When we're talking about shortages in math and shortages in foreign languages and shortages in special education and ESOL, there's not, when, there, when there's 26 math teachers in the state graduating and we're competing, that, that's what we're competing against. So it, it's important. I think, I think the city of Charlottesville, Albert does a really nice job, the school boards, uh, the, the city council, the boards do a nice job paying attention to the salaries. 
but it's something you can't take your eye off of because if you take your eye off of, we're going to be that next blue section with the teacher shortages. That's, at least that's my opinion. So, Employment in Virginia. Let me switch topics here real quick. Employment in Virginia is changing. There's what's called now a lot of middle skills jobs. What's a middle skills job? It's a job that requires more education than a high school diploma, but you don't necessarily need four years of education. There are a lot of those jobs out there uh, right now. Uh, middle skills jobs pay anywhere from about $35,000 to about $90,000. So we have kids that can actually leave our high schools, have credentials, go to a community college, get a, a go to a, for a one-year program, and get get pretty good jobs out there that, that pay pretty good money. Uh, that that piece of where we always you know dreamed that every kid had to go to college and get a four-year degree in order to be successful. That's not necessarily true anymore. Now, should we still have kids going to college? Absolutely. We still need doctors, <coughs> lawyers, you know, engineers. We still need those people. But everybody doesn't have to do that because there are more options on the table now uh, out there for, to do that. There's a program, the last bullet, program Governor McCall put in last year called the New Economy Workforce Credential Program. What that program does, it actually helps pay. It pays for two-thirds the cost to be in a program to get a workforce credential uh, for, for one of these high-skilled job, high jobs. Cybersecurity. Think about where we are. We have the Pentagon, we have Newport News, we have the shipyards, we have Norfolk, we have, we have a lot of military. Cybersecurity is a big industry in Virginia. Huge. There are more than 650 cyber related companies in Virginia. Northern Virginia actually has 10 of the world's five, top 500 uh, hottest and most innovative cybersecurity firms. Right now, uh, this data is from uh, October, this past October. In October, uh, there were 17,000 cybersecurity professionals needed in Virginia right now. And not all of those jobs need a four-year degree. Matter of fact, a lot of them don't need a four-year degree. Uh, cybersecurity salaries in Virginia range from 70,000 to 180,000, with the average salary being $88,000. I want to put in a plug real quick for career tech education. It's not vocational education. Vocational education is one part of career technical education. Okay? So when people hear career technical education, no, my child's not going to go do that program. I want them to do something. They don't. Part of it is being a welder or, or, or being a, you know, a nurse or, or being some of those things that, that we tra tra traditionally think of. Okay? auto mechanics, whatever. But the whole other side, guess where STEM is? STEM is a career in tech field. Um, if, if you look at these clusters, there are 16 clusters. And if you go through theirs and you go to the Department of Education, go under CTE and see all this in detail. Go ahead, uh, move, yes. Uh, there's some more jobs, science, technology, engineering, transportation. There are so many jobs under the career in technical education field. That, that students need to go into. Uh, it, it's incredible. This is just a quick point. Every one of those jobs that they list on the CTE uh, page, you can go and it actually has a four-year plan laid out for your student. What math, what English, what science, what social studies they should be taking to go into that career tech ed field. Um, Another topic real quickly uh, about uh, students and the, the uh, putting students in jail is what this, uh, what this article talks about. Uh, it talks about Virginia likes to be number one, but we weren't very proud of this. We were number one in this category. We, we had the largest number of students that we were sending to cops to the courts. And this article goes on to talk about uh, the, the disproportionate number of, of black children and special ed students that we suspend out of school as compared to white students. Um, the program, you know, what is what is called is uh, classrooms to courtrooms. Uh, it has gotten a lot of attention at, in Richmond. Uh, Governor McAuliffe has uh, called a task force together and started working on this. Secretary Holden, while she was still there, started focusing on this along with uh, 
uh, Secretary, I mean, uh, Superintendent Staples. So all those people are looking at this, at this to, to, to work on it. If you look at Virginia, we actually, over the last five years, it has started declining. But it's still, the numbers are still higher than what they need to be uh, along the way. Um, locally, I will say that I know the local school divisions, uh, including these two and even some of the other surrounding, are implementing programs uh, such as uh, res responsive classroom, uh, PBIS, uh, some other programs that they're doing, uh, restorative practice to try to work on the number of out of school, reducing the number of out of school suspensions for all students, especially in those areas. Uh, here's just a couple programs. We can go through these real quick. There's a couple programs. These are a couple things that the Department of Education is doing. They're working with the Regional Education Laboratory, Appalachia Regional uh, Education Laboratory, to work on this. Um, they go ahead, go forward. They're working with Virginia Tech on influence of the juvenile justice system. They're working with the University of Virginia. They partnered with them to look at school climate research. So Virginia has gone out. They were not very proud of that piece of data. So they have gone out this very aggressively to, to look at this and work with this. Um, I, I don't even know if we have time to even talk about this. This is a whole subject. <laughs> ESSA, that's the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind. Uh, some things have changed. Uh, I'll give you, I've got about four slides, but I'm going to do like three seconds. Uh, basically, there's some things that have stayed. You know, you still have to measure kids in reading, math, and science, I think, once it is what it is. But they've also given some leniency on some things that you can look at uh, as well. Uh, there's still uh, federal accountability on identifying how schools uh, for school improvement. Um, this is the one that I absolutely hate. The lowest 5% of Title I schools based on performance of all students. Think about this. Every Title I school could pass with flying colors, but there will always be the lowest 5%. There's no benchmark for, for this measurement that says, if you get over this, you're good. They're always going to take the lowest 5%. So you can have everybody with 100% passing, but somebody would have to be identified as the lowest 5%. I don't know why the feds did not get rid of that part of it when they reauthorized this. That, that is not a very good measure at all. That, that's, a, that's a tough measure uh, on, how the, on how they do that. Um, yeah, just, so, so a lot has changed. Yeah, it's just. We could do a whole forum just on this. Yeah, absolutely. You could do a whole piece just on ESSA. Uh, I would not be very diligent if I didn't advertise my own firm here. So uh, I have the, uh, and, I, and I'm doing this for a reason. I do think, the reason I think the Virginia High School League is important, we are a uh, nonprofit, but our customers are the 316 high schools in Virginia. Our membership are the principals of those schools, the athletic directors of those schools, the superintendents of those school divisions. The reason I bring that up because we're talking about performance assessment. We're talking about kids thinking critically, being creative. Doing things. We're talking about performance tasks. That happens when you do, uh, when you participate in after school activities. All the data is very clear. Students who participate in after school activities of any kind have better grades, they're more successful in college, they have more successful careers, they have few, they few, they're fewer of them drop out of college. Uh, the other thing is this, we are open to anybody. We don't discriminate on what school you're in. You can participate in active, Virginia High School League activities anywhere we, anywhere we go. We have, last year we had over 195,000 students participate. The thing that a lot of people know, go ahead, the, the, the one thing that people really don't know, not only do we sponsor sports, we also sponsor academic activities. We sponsor all of these activities over here as well. And those things are great. We just did a uh, student leadership conference up at uh, Freedom High School last weekend. We had 910 kids there uh, for a student leadership conference. So it was really good stuff. Uh, so uh, if you ever want to uh, get involved in Virginia High School League. It's a great organization. It's a piece that I think supports schools, supports kids along the way. Uh, Dr. Kastner gave us, gave this to us. I remember this was my first year as principal. 
and he gave us this. And I've always kept this framed and kept it on my, on my office wall because I truly believe this. It, it, Ron Edmonds was one of the educators back in the early 70s. He was an African American, and he was one of the early shakers and movers when we got to do something different in education. He goes, no, we're going to have a problem. And he realized that then. Uh, we can, whenever and where we choose, successfully teach all children whose school is of interest to us. I believe that. I believe we already know more than we need to do that. The research is clear. The research has been clear for years. You get kids in, in preschool programs, you get them in kindergarten programs, they have to be reading on grade level by the end of the second grade. If not, you have all kinds of issues out of that deal. We, we know what we have to do to educate children. Whether or not we do it must finally depend on how we feel about the fact that we haven't so far. And I believe that everyone in this room believes that or you wouldn't be here tonight because you want to do something about it as well and that's why you're here because you don't have to be here. This is not a school board meeting. This is not about your children being in school. But we have to get everybody in our communities to believe this. We, we, have, we know what we need to do, get whether it's pay teachers more, programs we need to do, whatever it is. We just need to do it and take care of our kids. So um, I think I'm for Yes. So, that was a fast version. I'll be glad to answer any questions or any of those you want to talk about. Uh, but thank you, and uh, I hope I brought something to the table that uh, will interest you, and uh, be glad to answer any questions. I wanted to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, this is, it's, I'm perfectly placed, I think, in the, in the, in the, um, the chain of, of, of presentations, um, especially Billy following you with some of that big picture, the profile of the graduate. You know, our job in education, no matter where we are, what, what, whether we're middle school, elementary, secondary, we have an overall um, goal is to successfully help students reach the benchmarks for their graduation. And we have to do that regardless of and Juan's slides really showed about a lot of the, the, the diversity that's really come into this area um, and certainly nationally. But regardless of economic, socioeconomic advantage or disadvantage, we do that regardless if a student has been to school in a refugee camp um, or has lived in a refugee camp and hasn't been to school until they come into the United States of America. We have to do that. Um, for children who are sick and can't come to school to learn. We have to do that regardless of what language they speak. And what we are also, what we also have, despite the fact that we have so many um, needs in education and that our salaries aren't that large, we have people that want to do this work. Right now I've got, I'm hiring for next year about five different positions. And what my school continues to grow, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I tell you, I have about 100 applicants right now that want to come to a school like mine. And my school, Greer Elementary School, is the, one of the largest, most diverse um, elementary schools in Albemarle County. A lot of people, when I, when I share about our school, they say, Albemarle County? That's a, you, you mean you have a really diverse school? I said, yes, I do. Yes, ma'am, yes, sir. But there are a few of our schools that are in the, what we call the urban ring that surrounds Charlottesville City. And they also are in that corridor of 29. That is what Albemarle says is their growth corridor. Albemarle, and I've only been here for five years. I came here from Fairfax from that blue section. Uh-huh, um, from the blue section. And I will tell you, as a Fairfax County person, I was there for 26 years um, before I came to Charlottesville. And it took me two years to find a job in Charlottesville. I wanted to be a principal, but I wanted to be in a principal of a Title I school. Um, I fell in love with Charlottesville over a two-year time. I was doing a um, wonderful program for principals uh, that uh, Curry and Darden had together. It was called a Turnaround Principalship Program. And it, <clears throat> it was two years, and I would come three times a year um, over that time, and it would be like one in the summer, one in the fall, another one in the winter. And every time I would leave, 
Northern Virginia, driving in my car with all the traffic, I'd get over here. Like, this place is amazing. And I bugged, I bugged the superintendent um, so much. I actually went to a conference one time because I know she was going to be there to say, I've been trying to get into Albemarle or Charlottesville City and I can't find a principal job. Um, but uh, she really didn't talk to me that time. It was a little <laughs> bit later. Um, but I say that because I think here in Charlottesville, while there are some areas that are um, challenged for us to find uh, teachers. I tell you what, I have just been so um, proud and pleased that we have those educators that want to do this work. They want to walk into a school of almost 80% of our, ch our children um, and our families are, are economically disadvantaged. Some of those families have, have only been economically disadvantaged after losing a job. That some of them are economically disadvantaged because they have been um, uh, they, their families have been, they have grown up in that, and they are trying very hard to make ends work, to meet. They have, they work three and four jobs, and, you know, they talk, we talk sometimes about the lack of parent involvement in some of our schools, and I say, you know what, you get your child to school so we can educate them every day, and you take care of your, your, your family, and putting the clothes, the food that they need, and you're doing your job as a parent. And so I am just such a proud principal of a very highly uh, diverse school, and one that sometimes people would say, boy, if I look at your school online and I look at your test scores, I'm not going to see, like, I'm not sure that that is a really great school. And I always say to people that call me and say, Robin, you know, I don't know, we're in this area, and I don't know if I want to go to this school. And I say, at least you're asking. You want to learn more about it. Our school last year, when we talk about um, the goals that we have and, and the fact that it used to be no child left behind, now Billy, you're talking about um, elementary, ESSA elementary and secondary school act, we have expectations. And what we have to do is make sure, no matter what we do, is to make sure that children can, can achieve those. But at some of our schools, what I'm, what I'm finding in the last five years that I've been at Greer, I came to Greer five years ago and we had 450 students and now we have about 200, we have about 670 students now. This snapshot is actually what I call my dashboard. It helps me talk about my school a little bit. And I have a, a paper copy of that if you want to take one with you. But some of the fascinating facts that a lot of people don't know about, about Greer is that this, this box, and I know you can't really see this in the back, but this really looks at our mobility. What I'm finding now is there is a tremendous amount of mobility. Students that come in after school has started. How many of you all went to the same elementary school for your entire elementary career? How many of you went to two elementary schools? One, two, three, four, five, almost six of you. How about three or more? One, two, three, four. More than, th more than three? More than four. Okay. So what we're finding is more and more of our students are moving around a lot. Whether they're moving around between the city schools and the county schools or other counties, we're also having a lot moving in from other states and many, as Juan shared, from outside of the United States. Lots of immigrants coming in. Um, this, I, I update this um, monthly. This was updated in uh, the 14th of April. Since the first day of school, we've welcomed 111 new students at Greer. 111 new students at Greer. We're accountable for all of them. And 111 students. So I've got students coming in, and we have to assess them when they come in. We have to learn about their strengths and their needs. We meet their families. Um, what we're finding is about four, three or four years ago, of the students that come in after the first day of school, about 50% of those students would be what I would call academically at risk. They've moved around a lot, they have academic gaps. And now we've got about 98% of our students that come in after the first day of school that are automatically qualifying for um, in some sort of an intervention, whether that be special education. Um, and I don't, I don't say a gap is, is language, but there's oftentimes we do need to make sure that their language is filled. And we also have had about 81 students leave our school. So in any one given classroom of, let's say, 22 students, 
you can expect to have about five or six new students coming in and maybe four leaving. And so the community in that classroom continues to change. Now our students, on the other hand, are amazing ambassadors for their classrooms and schools. They welcome new students in. We have students that speak probably 52 to 53 languages and dialects. Um, it, it's, it's amazing. We are actually in Albemarle County, the single feeder um, county school for the International Rescue Committee. So in the city schools, when they come in, they do spread out. Their housing is spread out through the city, but it's pretty consolidated in Albemarle County. And so they all, if they're in elementary school, they come to me. If they're in middle school, they go to Jewett. And if they're in high school, they go to Albemarle High School. And so we have, um, we have about 32 refugee students and 16 brand new ones this year, and that was just last month. Um, and we've gotten about three more. And so the, the, they bring such a rich diversity. And also, um, the same students that come in, even if they come in after the first day of school, the Virginia Standards of Learning Assessments, they have to take, if they're in third grade, fourth grade, or fifth grade, in English. They don't have to take the reading, but they have to take the math. And they have to take the science. So it is quite the challenge for all of us. We, we also recognize that you know, when a child is here for a, a portion of a year, our job is to fill them up just as much as we can. But even our state, even with the profile of the graduate that Billy's talking about, at least they recognize that it takes three to five to seven years to acquire English as a, as a, as a, as a language, as a second language. And for children that have been educated um, in, in their country and had the opportunity to go to school in their country, it actually doesn't take as long as that. But we do have, our, especially our refugee families, um, some of the families, they have never been able to be to school, be, go to school. And some of them maybe three hours a day in the refugee, or the refugee camp school. And if they have a disability, for instance, cerebral palsy, or if we have a student that just started and he's blind, he was never allowed to go to school. And never allowed to go to school. And so now, um, he, he's only been at our school for about five days. And he's, he is completely blind. He can see like pinholes. And that little guy is building towers. And that little guy is putting blocks together. And that little guy is starting to, 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 to count blocks. And this is five days. So he has never been to school. And he comes to school every day so excited. So we are, are, um, we are blessed with our mobility, but it also challenges us. For the first time this year, and Billy, this, is, this will be an interesting one for you, is of our fifth grade cohort of students, 50% of those students were not at our school last year. They're new this year. Fourth grade, 50% of our cohort of fourth grade, new to our school this year. Third grade, 50% of our students are new this year. Not as much in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. But in our graduating class of fifth graders last year, we had a smaller graduating class, about 84. We only had 16 that had been there since kindergarten. 16, so when we kind of, you all put your hands up earlier, it's amazing to me. So this mobility, so we actually are held accountable for our test scores for a lot of students that we don't educate. And in Virginia, those assessments are really created as cumulative assessments. So they are, you know, the fifth grade science test is the entire fourth grade curriculum of science and the entire fifth grade curriculum of science. And so when you see a little dip in those test scores and you look at our mobility, you can say, oh, that's, that's it. It's not that our kids aren't learning, it's that we've got some gaps that we're trying to fill. So these educators that we're talking about, these educators that are hugely dedicated are really working to meet every child's individual needs. The growing changes in Albemarle County really have been a shocker. Coming from Northern Virginia, to me, I was so used to, to just a mobile and very diverse um, county. And the schools that I chose to work in were, were all um, Title I schools, and how many of you know what, it, do you know what a Title I school is? I don't want to talk. Some of you do not, but Title I is really just um, the federal, federal Title I funds um, are given to schools in school divisions who, in schools that have higher amounts of students that qualify for free and reduced lunch. So the Title I funds from, from about, if you have about 40% of students that qualify for free and reduced 
up, you will get a chunk, you can, the school division gets a, some extra federal money. But with that money is the caveat, and what used to be no child left behind, every single child in every single um, subgroup category then is judged as who's making the progress and who is not. Great intention of that law, we don't want to leave any child behind, but sometimes that law doesn't, under, doesn't keep up with um, the changing, um, especially the changing mobility. Um, so ESSA is getting there, and I think Steve Staples, our state superintendent, is actually looking at um, a whole new look at really holding schools accountable for progress made. Um, schools like mine, when you compare my scores this year, the cohort last year was completely different. So, but I'm um, compared to how I did last year, um, to how I did, do this year. So some of the things um, that are also very interesting, we do, um, as Juan shared, he, he talked a lot about the, the, the students that speak English as a second language and how their school division um, has additional staffing to support those. We serve, we directly serve about 249 students and we have four and a half teachers that, that help us with that English. Um, the, the rest of the day, the students are fully immersed. And in elementary school, what's wonderful about that is the rich language that they acquire. Um, with that, we also, I think, are challenged a bit by the number of students that is rising in our area of students that are becoming homeless and it's families that are evicted and have to move. Um, and we are having a lot of, about 60 of our families now live with another family because they're unable to, 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 to secure housing on their own. And so what we're trying to really do is to keep the stability. So if a child becomes, if a family becomes homeless um, or they have to move in with a, a parent or a, a brother or a sister on a temporary basis, we really work very hard to make sure that that child's school doesn't have to change. So there's a lot of resources that go into to having you know, transportation provided and other things for the family so that that education can remain consistent for that child. And I think we're pretty, um, I think we're very successful with that, um, at least for the families that let us know that that's going on for them. Sometimes we um, have students, and we have to, in, in education, I mean, at schools every day, you know, you remember um, if you have children in the schools, if they had to stay home for a day, you needed to call the office and say, Robin is, you know, she's got strep throat, she's not going to be at school today. We have to account for every child every day. So when we have families that call us, we know where children are. If we don't have families that call us, it's our job that we have to figure out. Are they sick? Did something happen at the bus stop? You know, what happened? And so sometimes we do, we track those student absences to make sure that we, um, aren't, we, we're not losing students, but sometimes they are gone for two or three days and we, we don't know where they are. So we've got to figure that out. And often we find that their family then has had to move. Um, and so we, we keep them on our, on our register um, until they are enrolled in another um, elementary school in, in another you know, county or even within the, within the county. So some of the things that, that we are challenged with um, are, are very unlike other elementary schools um, in Albemarle. And I think when I spoke at the breakfast, um, you wanted me to really share some of the differences because in educating some of the families and, and, and community members in Albemarle, just how different some of our schools are and some of the things that we're really trying to do to mitigate that and also to serve every single child and give them that best, the best education that we, we can provide. Last year, um, our school, I'm very proud to say that of um, the federal government, when they, when they look at the accountability subgroups, they call them, there's 18 that schools are accountable for. And Greer made growth in 17 of those 18 um, subgroups. And, and we are really proud of that. And we're still labeled a school of warning because of the, you're judged by your lowest performing subgroup category, regardless of how many gains you make. And that one subgroup category is actually um, Hispanic reading. So students, Hispanic students, and they're reading, we are not making the mark that we need to make with some of those students. So we are working uh, our goals this year around that and also filling the gaps with those same students that are, that were in third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade that have now moved up to that next grade. So we set our goals according to the needs of our students. We set our school budget according to the needs of our students. Our, our classroom teachers have to set goals for their own evaluation 
and we, 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 I have them make sure that every single one of their teaching goals, professional goals, is tied to the needs of the students within their classroom. So what are they, what do they need to know as an educator, what do they need to get better at in order to serve the students in greater ways. And they are measured now, 40% of their evaluation is tied to the student achievement in their classroom. And not necessarily just test scores, but growth that they make throughout that year. So we monitor growth on a regular basis and then we pay attention when students are not making that growth and then we have ways to respond. This tiered support um, here is really just the different kinds of additional services we provide students who need it from gifted and enrichment services to perhaps special education or students with um, that, that might have um, behavioral needs that actually interfere with the learning of either themselves and sometimes others in a classroom. Um, so we do have a lot of students that are exposed to things like domestic violence. Um, you've got, we've got some, uh, you know, some students, I can think of several, and they have been exposed to a lot in their lives. And so when they become frustrated, instead of saying, hey, you made me mad, they may take the chair and push it. And it's, we spend time teaching them, when you're mad, how to use your words. And how we're not going to hurt someone else to do that, but we're going to use our words. And so our teachers have to have those different hats. I think you talked about that at the beginning when you opened us up is, you know, you've got to be the teacher, you've got to be the counselor. Sometimes you are that parent. Um, and I have the same hats. I put them all on um, as I try to do my job each and every day with our, with our families and our, our children. But thank you for letting me share a little bit of Greer. And I certainly would be more than happy to answer any questions um, after Brian is done. Hello, hello. Yeah. So I'm Brian Wheeler, and I'm the executive director of Charlottesville Tomorrow. And whether you knew it or not, you are in our newsroom. Uh, th this is our office, so I want to welcome you uh, to City Space, which we help manage for the city of Charlottesville. So I'm going to talk about education through the lens of politics and news. And some of the people in this room uh, got me involved in these things. So I'm going to talk about them a little bit. And uh, for me, really, I was thinking back, the reason I'm here tonight is because of a realtor, because of a classroom that had too many students in it, and because of a school board election. So a realtor, a big classroom, and a school board election. So the realtor told us when we were looking for a house, oh, you've got to live in Western Albemarle. That's the place to live. That's where the best schools are. And so we live in Ivy. And my students graduated from Western Albemarle schools. And they got a great education. Um, but we made that choice as we were looking around for a place to live. Now, I'm, I moved here in 1984 to go to the University of Virginia. Met my wife at UVA. And then uh, we got married and wanted to stay in Charlottesville. And we started living in uh, Crozet, then Fluvanna, then over near Woodbrook, and then eventually to Ivy. So when my daughter reached second grade at Murray Elementary, there were 27 students in her classroom, which was a lot. Now, I don't know what your average class size is for second grade. Not 27. You're, it's too many. <laughs> And my wife and I debated, okay, who's gonna to go to the school board meeting and raise a fuss about this? And I went to the, to not the school board meeting, the PTO meeting. I went to the PTO meeting, and the PTO was really gun shy about dealing with this. They'd had their wrist slap for getting involved in politics, and they, they really said, that's not our role. We're just trying to help the schools and the parents and teachers, and they didn't really didn't want to do anything. The principal outlined what the problem was. The principal said there was a challenge funding his budget to hire enough staff to fill Murray Elementary with teachers. So I was working at SNL Financial at the time, as Madison mentioned, so I knew a little bit about the internet and email. And I went up to the principal, Tim Frazier, at the end of the evening, and I said, Tim, how about you give me some information about this problem and I'll share it with parents. And we'll spread the word and, and we'll see what we can do about this. And Tim Frazier said, Brian, that's brilliant because then I can say it's not me, it's not the PTO, it's just some parent who's you know, causing trouble. 
And uh, so as my kids were collecting candy that Halloween, I was collecting the neighbor's email addresses. And that's how we built our first uh, email newsletter about schools. And I learned a lot about the budget. And I was a student of Larry Sabato's from University of Virginia. So I knew politics was a good thing, right? So I'm paying attention to politics, much as I'm sure you are right now. Um, <laughs> And I thought, you know, when I went to vote that November, I'm in the middle of this crisis at Murray Elementary, but I thought I was ready to go vote. And I go in the voting booth, got my plan, click, 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 and I get to the bottom of the ballot. School board, at large, I had no idea that was gonna be on the ballot. There were three names there, and I had no idea who to vote for. Uh, Madison was already on the board at that time, so I couldn't vote for Madison. And, and I felt terrible. I felt guilty. I felt like I'd let Larry down. I wasn't ready to, to vote. And I abstained on that race because I, did, I didn't know what to do. And, um, and then I'm in the middle of this challenge with the school board, trying to figure out how to fund Murray Elementary. And um, so briefly, you know, what I learned about politics is the initial reaction from some elected officials is, it's not my problem, it's somebody else's problem. Now, I'm not casting aspersions on anyone in the room, but in general, I would go to the principal, and the principal said, Brian, the problem's with the school board. They're not giving me enough money. And I go to the school board, and the school board would say, the problem's with the board of supervisors. They're not giving us enough money. Go to the board of supervisors. The school board's not asking us for enough money. Go back to the board of supervisors. Well, it's really, the General Assembly, that's where the problem is. They're not properly funding education in the state. So I was feeling like I was getting the runaround. So what do you do then? So you, you go to the next politician up the ladder. So Emily Couric was our state senator. So I talked to Emily. Emily, what can we do about this? And she volunteered to call a meeting of the superintendent, my supervisor, Sally Thomas, my school board member, Madison Cummings, the principal, everyone was in the room. She's like, Brian, would that help? I'm like, sure, let's do it. And of course, the phone call immediately goes from central office to the school. Tim, your parents are out of control. You know, get them in line. <laughs> What's going on? Why is the state senator calling me uh, to tell me there's a problem? Well, we learned a lot about the budget. We learned about um, differentiated funding, that uh, some schools get more resources because they have more challenges. They need more staff. And Murray Elementary in Ivy was seen as a school that was sitting pretty in a lot of ways. It didn't have a lot of challenges in its student population. And, and so I learned about that budgetary decision, those value judgments the community has to make when it's funding education. Um, what ended up happening was Sally Sally's advice to me was, Brian, you, this, if, if you want to address this, it can't just be seen as a problem in Ivy. You need, to, you need to examine countywide what's going on with the budget. And so I took on that challenge and we started looking countywide. And a group of us worked together to get more information about the county at large. Long story short, four years later, my name was on the ballot in that same spot ran for school board, was a barely elected, 101 votes, uh, countywide was the differential. And, and so what I would say is that, you know, politics does matter. Um, elections are important, every place on the ballot. So you may be paying a special, special attention right now to national politics, but don't forget local politics, local elections. This year is a local election year. Now, there's statewide races, too. But there are school board races. There are supervisor races. There are city council races. So as I was finishing my work at SNL Financial, I was looking for a new job. And I met the two people that would become the co-founders of Charlottesville Tomorrow, Michael Bills and Rick Middleton. And they had a vision for a nonprofit that could provide information to the community to help make better decisions, right? Share information broadly, and let's make sure that the quality of life 
in this community is maintained. Well, that spoke to me very strongly because I've been involved in the school issues. I've been involved in a land use challenge out in Ivy. And uh, so I was learning about more about politics, more about local government, zoning and ordinances and things like that. And so I jumped at the opportunity to work with them to create Charlottesville Tomorrow in 2005. So 12 years ago, we launched as a nonprofit community organization, and we started covering local government. Now, I was on the school board, so we weren't covering schools, but we were covering land use and transportation and community design issues. And um, we didn't realize it at the time, but we were citizen journalists. We didn't think we were doing journalism initially. But in hindsight, looking in the rearview mirror, we were at the forefront of the citizen journalism movement and at the um, complete cratering of the newspaper financial model, right? Newspapers, newsrooms were shrinking because they no longer had the revenue to support them because advertising dollars went somewhere else. People started advertising on Craigslist, on Google, not in the newspaper. So if a newspaper has fewer dollars, they have fewer staff. Newsrooms shrunk. Uh, the last time until recently that the newspaper had an education reporter was 2005, same year Charlottesville Tomorrow launched. Um, so fast forward a couple years, 2009, the Daily Progress knocked on our door at Charlottesville Tomorrow, and they asked if our government reporting could be part of the newspaper. And we said, yes, that'd be great. We would like our little email list and our little website to reach more people. So we eagerly handed them our content. And we've now been in partnership with the Daily Newspaper for eight years. And now we produce about 60% of their content on the topics that we cover. So land use, transportation, community design, and now that I'm off the school board, public schools. So we started covering public schools in 2013, and now we have a full-time education reporter. Um, and thanks to the support of many of you in this room who've, who've helped us fund that, so we appreciate that. So now that I've been through these different roles, both on the school board, um, I was a parent activist, journalist, and now I don't get to do any news reporting anymore, so now I'm more the editor and publisher of Charlottesville Tomorrow. Um, I can tell you, we, the reason our board picked education was because we saw it as a critical quality of life issue in this community. And I'm, you're here, and I'm sure you'd, you know, wouldn't disagree with that. And it's important for a number of reasons, whether you're moving your family here or you're moving a business here. And what I've learned is that we have great schools everywhere in this community. I, people ask me a lot, where should I live in town? And I you know, think back to what the realtor told me. And now I tell them, you know, live as close to where you work as possible, uh, because then you won't be driving on the roads. Because uh, I've written a lot of transportation stories. And I, I tell them it doesn't, it doesn't really matter where you live in this community. We have great schools everywhere. Now, are you going to run into challenges? Yes, everywhere. You'll run into a teacher you don't like. You might run into a principal you don't like. Um, and you know, that's just the way it is. But what I learned is we've got great educators and, and our students are getting great educations everywhere they go. So as we, at Charlottesville Tomorrow, as we launched our education initiative, I sort of brought that, the mindset of a school board member to this. And my mindset was, let's focus on K-12, kindergarten through 12th grade in the city and the county. And I thought that'd be enough for us to wrap our heads around and share some information about. And then our brand new education reporter, Tim Shea at the time, went to a Board of Supervisors meeting where there was a big brouhaha and debate about pre-K, early childhood education. And I hadn't realized that was gonna be an important part of our work at the time. Because I, and the reason was, getting into the politics here and sort of separation of responsibilities, in Albemarle County, Pre-K is handled by the Board of Supervisors as a funding initiative, not by the school board. 
So bringing my school board hat, I was like, well, that's, that's not in our bailiwick. You know, that's the Board of Supervisors. And Tim Shea came back from that meeting and he said, Brian, I think we're going to have to write about this. Um, there's a big debate going on about who's going to fund this and how it's going to work. And so we started covering early childhood. And that was one of the first education initiatives we really threw ourselves at. And so our approach at Charlottesville Tomorrow is to, to be nonpartisan, fact-based, objective, share the best information we can with the community, let you make up your own mind. But we also try to convene people around these topics. So we've con worked with the United Way to convene people around early childhood and get the research on the table and look for best practices. Uh, how else is this being funded around the country? Let's write a news story about social impact bonds, for example. Um, let's get people together. Let's get the elected officials in the room. And let's have them see this data and then ask them what they're going to do about it. And so I think that's been a powerful part of our model. And we've, we've done this in other uh, coverage areas. Um, I think there are a whole lot of issues. And I, and I imagine the people in this room can ask us questions uh, that we can respond to. But, you know, things I think about are um, the, the big ticket items, you know, the budget. We write a lot about the school budget. Albemarle County's school budget is bigger than the entire city budget, the entire city of Charlottesville. Albemarle County Public Schools, last time I checked, is the third largest business in this part of Virginia. I mean, UVA and the hospital are both bigger. I don't think anything else is bigger than Albemarle County Public Schools. Maybe the military base, Ravana Station. So it's big business, it's big money, and it's our tax dollars at work. Um, and there's some big decisions to be made. The community's growing. Where's the next high school going to be? That'll be something we're talking about. We just did a bond referendum, the first time in 40 plus years that Albemarle County did a voter bond referendum. That was to raise money for capital projects. And now they're talking about doing another one in a couple years. So these, this, the need to take care of our infrastructure on the school side is mounting. We have older schools. They need renovations. We have more students coming in. I, I was on the board when we approved your expansion yeah. at Greer. And now apparently that wasn't enough, right? That school is full now. So what happens when you fill schools? And it's like a balloon. If you squeeze a balloon, what happens? It gets big somewhere else. Um, redistricting. As a school board member, talk about politics, redistricting is the hardest thing you know, you're know you going to get involved with in Almar County. And um, it is coming up again. It's going to be studied, I think, starting in the fall. So there's some decisions about where can we use capacity that we're not using it today? Where do we need schools that we don't have them today? And in the case of Yancey Elementary down near Scottsville, is there a school that maybe is not needed in the future? So that's going to be a big public policy debate in the months ahead, is what's the future of a small rural school that's not in this designated growth area that Robin was talking about? And if there aren't students coming into it, and the students who are there are not meeting uh, our, our benchmarks for performance, what do we do about that as a community? Do we keep investing in a small elementary school? Um, or do we try to consolidate and get those students in another location? And I'm not, you know, again, we don't take sides, but th these are the types of public policy issues that Charlottesville Tomorrow is going to cover and that um, impact the community. Another interesting thing, and the educators in the room hear this all the time, but most of the people in Albemarle County, most of the adults who vote, don't have kids in the schools. 70% of the voters in Albemarle County, give or take, don't have kids in the schools. So um, everyone is paying for good public schools. And those of you who've gone through public schools and supported them over the years, you know, you know why that system is the way it is. But it can be a challenge then for a public body to try to go raise public dollars when most of the people don't have kids using those services today. So that's something that we cover. Certainly, the, I think the immigration issues and the uh, refugees, that's a big uh, topic. And another thing we try to do at Charlottesville Tomorrow is make sure something like that 
its attention and focus in a, in a way that um, is true to, I think, um, the benefits that the community is getting from having diverse populations join us and enrich our lives here. And so we try to put a focus on uh, sometimes things that maybe a, a traditional newsroom would not. Um, we try to cover diversity in ways that we can show um, minority students in, in uh, a different light than you might expect. So we think very thoughtfully about that, about how we can showcase every, you know, the richness throughout the school division. Um, I make our education reporters go to Murray, Murray High School um, at the graduation. The Murray High School graduation is one of the best events in Albemarle County every year. Now, the, we're talking 30 students graduating from you know, a typical Murray High School class, but I would start crying on the first student and then never recover um, by the end of the evening. And the reason is they would invite somebody to come up on stage with them and hand them their diploma. And that person would tell a story about that student at that charter high school. Albemarle County has two charter schools. Um, I'm going to finish up here so we can ask, answer questions. But, you know, there, there are a lot of exciting things like that. And part of what I enjoy about my job is that experience I had on the school board lets me steer our reporters in the directions to find these compelling stories. Um, and why don't I stop there? And thank you for uh, having us tonight. Are we going to come up now and answer questions? Yes. Yep. Um, yeah, hi, thank you all. It was really, really fascinating. And I, and I just wanted to say to Robin that I've been a nature guide at Ivy Creek Natural Area for 25 years, and I request Grimm students. This is the coolest school. And I, I just love your kids. Um, but my mine goes to the city. I've been a city resident for 40 uh, years and was on the city school board. And, um, and I'm interested in the profile of the graduate and this changing profile of the graduate. Um, because we have an interesting problem in Charlottesville where most of the kids, CHS grads, who enroll at our community college can't, can't pass the math or English or both uh, entrance, um, which reflects a, a big problem we have in our native-born minority population that with literacy, where not really that many more than half of our African-American kids can pass the English and math tests all the way through. So I just wonder how, and I don't think that's probably necessarily all that unusual, but um, you know, given many of the factors that you talked about, but how does that play into the profile of the graduate that is looking at a lot of different um, factors? Uh, when I was at DOE, uh, actually uh, Michael Bolding, Robin's brother, who was the director of mathematics, he and I were on a committee with the community college system. They, they actually had uh, a, a committee set up and they were actually studying that. The, uh, the lady that came in to be the vice chancellor from uh, North Carolina, uh, she had data from North Carolina. North Carolina dropped that test because what they found out was that the correlation between the high school math, the community college math, and that test were not related whatsoever. So, so what North Carolina did was if a student had a two point, I think it was a 2.6 GPA coming out of high school and had taken at least Algebra two, they admitted their students. Virginia's Community College is the last I checked when I left DOE, which was last June. That's the way the community college system in Virginia was looking ahead because that test is not a very good test. Uh, it's not, it, it doesn't really assess it. It's got great skills on it, but it doesn't really assess the kids what we teach them. And it, it assesses in a totally different way. So the kids go in there, they, they, Michael and I always thought the kids knew the stuff, but the way the questions were asked, the way the assessment was written, it wasn't a very good test. So I think you're gonna see that change uh, from, from what I saw, what was going on when I left right. the DOE. And I just wanna chime in that one of the reasons that I got on the school board, because I had been mentoring for many years, and, the, and some of the things that I saw from the outside looking in is 
I didn't see minority kids in those AP classes and honor mm -hmm. classes and things. And so that was one of the things I wanted to change. One of the reasons I teamed up with Lee, and I think that we have had an impact on it. <coughs> but now we're pushing out a lot of kids to be an avid. Mm -hmm. um, we just talked about it at the last school board meeting that I'm on some scholarship committees and I'm reading all these incredible essays and that the kids are writing and now I'm seeing that our kids that are in the ninth and tenth grade they're taking geometry they're taking algebra one and I think that our kids are doing it and I know a lot that our that our students are getting better but again that a lot of our kids come into the system at a, at a different level. I know that some sixth graders now, they're starting to take an Algebra one and Algebra two in the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. They have a lot more resources. I know that some of the, um, a lot of my, my minority kids that, that's in the Charlottesville school system, they're working from the ninth grade all the way through high school, 25 to 35 hours a week. In addition to trying to take some rigorous classes and you compare that with maybe a white student who both parents are highly educated, they, may, they don't necessarily need to work, they can take trig or whatever you need to do, they, and they, if they need help, they can get um, um, help. So I'm not trying to give an excuse, but I, I, have, I think that this is a wonderful community, but I really don't think you can go two or three blocks from this place here, and you, it's a whole different world from, for a lot of our students. And I'm, trying, I'm not trying to give excuses, I'm not saying that poor people can't learn but when you don't have internet, when you don't have a home, when you don't have like a, a space where you can go away around to because you have two or three families living with you, yeah. just to squirrel away and do your homework, nice, peace, and quiet, it's, it's just more obstacles. And I think that that's one of the things that makes our community richer. I like to tell, share this story that I, I visit different schools and I, a couple of years ago I went to Jack Jewett and you know, visit is one of the fun part of being a school board member, looking around, you go into them, they first and ask you, who, who daddy are you? I said, well, you all, you all my, my, my kids. Um, but around this table, around this table, it was someone from Tanzania, Honduras, Mexico, and Belmont. These kids are learning together, they're eating together, they're playing together. Um, but, and I'm sure that they all had different backgrounds as to how they got there. And um, this is what, particularly our two schools um, um, are, this is what we have them um, that this um that diversity. So without being said, I just just a, I follow up and then I follow up. I promise. Um, is is so but how does the lack of proficiency in English impact the profile of the graduate and really the futures of our kids, given what you know about um, and I'm looking at Billy Han here, um, because your presentation really spoke to this about career readiness and really the ability to, to do something after you've gotten a high school diploma, but you really are not proficient in English. And, that, and I'm not talking IRC kids, I'm talking native-born minority children, mostly, is who, who's being impacted in Charlottesville. I don't know if, if I have an answer for that question. Um, I, I do think it goes back to, you know, Robin's exactly right when she talked about after one year we expect our kids to be all caught up and, and, and do those, you know, be ready to go and pass those tests. And uh, Dr. Staples and, and, and the folks that are on the Department of Ed the State Board of Education right now, they realize that those aren't some realistic expectations. That's why they're trying to actually uh, put some programs in and, and actually look at the assessments, performance assessments. Uh, that, that we think will take kids to a different place where they'll have more opportunity to demonstrate about what they know and how they can do those kind of things. I think the other piece that they're talking about at the state level also is school improvement. The model of school improvement that we have right now, um, I can usually get along with most people very, very well, um, but I usually say what I've got to say, uh, and sometimes that gets me in trouble. And the school improvement model at DOE was not one of the things that I thought was really good. Not necessarily the people running it, but the model itself. Uh, when, when you go in and you, you, know, you listen to what, what both these folks are talking about with poverty, and when I went into Petersburg City Schools and Norfolk City Schools, and we were trying to deal with poverty and, and reading and math, you know, to have teachers post, you have to, if you're a school improvement, you have to post your lesson plan on the wall every day. You have to. Just, that comes in about fifth every day on the list. The first thing is make sure the child got to school safely, make sure that they had food for breakfast, 
make sure that you know something bad didn't happen to them at home last night, whatever. So there's a lot of things you got to take care of before that. So I, I think what what Dr. Staples and the Board of Education, the State Board of Education, look at is what's a different model. How can Robin knows her kids best. Rather than somebody from DOE coming and telling Robin how to improve her school, why don't we ask Robin what her plan is for improving her school, and then how can we support her from the state? I think that's more the model that you're going to see, and I think we're going to see, uh, see more models like that, which I think will be helpful. Um, the, the other piece I want to, uh, the other part of that answer I would give goes back to what, what Juan said. I, I've learned over the last four or five years uh, that I don't know whether I like the term achievement gap anymore. Uh, there are gaps in achievement, but I don't think we should focus on achievement. We should focus on opportunity gaps. It's when students don't have opportunities that they can't achieve at the same level of other kids. If you don't have internet at home, you don't have somebody that can read to you because you, you live in a one-parent family, that parent's working two or three jobs, and, or you don't have books or newspapers, I think those are the kind of things, those lack of opportunities create achievement gaps. And I think that's what you were talking to with, with some of the students compared to, to the, so I don't have a great answer for that one, but um, I do, I do think it's something that the, that the board's going to deal with. So. Thank I think it's a question on Good evening. Thank you all for this discussion. Uh, I, again, with the profile of the Virginia graduate, uh, and I know it, particularly in Albemarle County, we are moving quickly toward you know a high school 2022 model. And again, this same issue of equity and access, you know, is paramount. You know, we're not having these robust discussions like we need to, you know, around these issues because in as much as we're talking about literacy, math achievement, we also have to talk about the racial divide. We also have to talk about the fact of in, that we deal with educators who need consistent training and professional development. You talked about teachers leaving the profession. I will tell you, you know, as an educator for 24 years, pour into me with quality professional development. Pour into me not only incentivizing with compensation, but treat me like a professional. I have a master's degree. I have taught in many different environments. I you know, am steeped in my content area. And those are the things that I think also draw young people in. You know, I feel like Charlottesville has been a wonderful place for my family uh, and for my daughters. But I will tell you that having my daughter be the only African American in the Health and Medical Sciences Academy uh, at the 11th grade level, having my middle school be the only African American student in her credit bearing high school math class, having my elementary school student be the only African American or one of two in her elementary classroom and not see a teacher of color who's also steeped in their academic content um, is troublesome. You know, and it's not just a matter of putting bodies in the chair, it is a matter of making a commitment to change deficit thinking. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's part of that conversation where, you know, everything can't be decentralized. Sometimes you have to have certain things mandated and then work it. You have to talk about culturally responsive education, you know, when we're talking about meeting the needs of all children. And I do think we have wonderful opportunities here. Uh, but I'm wondering, you know, how are we going to get that 20 to 25 percent of students who currently don't have opportunity out in the workforce? How are we going to get them a job shadowing experience? Is our Charlottesville and Albemarle community prepared? Are our businesses prepared to take on high school students, you know, that may not look like they come from the Western feeder pattern? You know, uh, and I would say no, they're not. You know, uh, but I think it can be done. There's some great individuals and, and organizations who are trying to to change that model. But that's one thing that I would encourage you know us to continue to do is to have some of these tough and candid conversations um, about really creating those opportunities and doing the real work. Um, whether it's talking about financing, you know, funding it because I can give you a lot on K Tech. I think that is such a wonderful place, but I must tell you, when my family and I went there for the open house, I'm wondering why I have to buy my hybrid in Richmond and get a service there because we don't have hybrid mechanics here. I'm wondering why 
I'm not dealing with farm to table and I don't have local chefs pouring into KTEC for those students. I am excited about the cybersecurity network and hardware um, certification courses, but those are the things that Charlottesville and Albemarle County Public Schools needs to be touting so all of our kids can get there. You know, um, the management at KTEC and the squabbling over how that place is managed is, is, is bothering me because that should be the hub of some of these CTE yeah. opportunities for our kids, you know. So, not quite a question, but. <laughs> well said. Come well on said. up here. Yeah, yeah. well said. <laughs> just, just one comment. There will be some growing pains with the, with the profile of a graduate. Because, I mean, it, it's going to be different. It's going to be more than just you took these 12 courses and you got these eight verified credits and now you graduate. It's going to be different, and it's it, it's going to it's going to be some challenges. And I think school divisions and, and neighborhoods and school boards and, and people are going to have to come together. Uh, yeah, it, 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 there's the the board has had some difficult conversations. The state board trying to say, are we ready for this? Are we ready for this? But it's like you know, uh, Jared Cotton, who's the superintendent down in Henry County. Uh, Jared Cotton just moves forward all the time, and his answer is. If we wait one more one more year, we're going to lose another generation of kids. Mm -hmm. So we got to stop waiting. We got to start moving forward and get the work done. Because the longer we wait, the more kids we lose. So it won't be easy, but it's the right thing to do. <coughs> Pardon me, it's been a long month. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to speak as eloquently and concise as you did, so you have to bear with me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Right up here. Right up. I haven't, I haven't got there yet. I've been, I'm going to have to work on that for the next six months. Um, to add to what, at the very end, talking about the getting students ready. I, I don't have children, so but I, but I see what people are coming up. Um, getting students ready for going into to the workforce. I've noticed in, in the last, I'm not sure how long, decades, that you've taken electives out of schools, i.e. shop classes, or introductory electives to, in today's world, microelectronics. Um, you start pushing that, you know, you wanna teach, you know, internet, you know, security, cyber security, or other technologies, but why don't you teach the actual hands-on building applications. Do you know what it takes to build a circuit board? Do you know what it takes to design a, a chip? Get them interested at an early age because if they don't know what they like to do, then you're waiting too late for them to actually learn. Get them into woodworking, get them to get used to, have that math they're learning, those the, 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 the communication skills of knowing what they need to build by offering six weeks of electives in various metalworking, wood shop, you know, microelectronics. You can build robotics, but if you don't know how to build that circuit board or repair that circuit right. board, programming it is just, a, you know, absolutely, then you're sending it off to somebody else. So how do you, and, and this is reaching into KTEC. Um, two years ago, uh, my girlfriend lived with me, so she taught at KTEC for 15 years, adult continuing education. She's a master stonemason. Um, two years ago, they had a round table about creating K-Tech, and we were there. Um, one of the educators spoke up and said they needed to go to um, electronics because all cars are going into electronics and we need to push electronics. Well, I had to correct him on that because the, um, in an engine, it's, it's still an internal combustion engine. You have to teach the basics first. You have to start at the basics. And if you wait until you try to get them into K-Tech, you're not giving them that exposure, so why aren't we getting it back into the electives, into the high school? Because if you're getting them ready for jobs, they need to know what they like to do. You can't just drop them off and go figure it out. So my question is, are you looking at putting electives, uh, shop classes, back into schools, okay. into the high school, into the, you know, with the language arts? Uh, I'll just say one, I mean, I used to be on the KTEC board when I was on the Albemarle County School Board. And one observation I had over the years was it, it seemed to me um, um, difficult to give students access to those programs because it was at a different facility. 
w once the decision was made to pull those things out of the comprehensive high school, it became a lot harder for students to try a stonemason class or a carpentry class or electrical. And you know, I know why the community did it, economies of scale and let's work better together with the city of Charlottesville. And we do special education the same way at, at the Piedmont Regional Education Program. But when I was on the KTEC board, you know, I was one of the members saying, listen, if NASCAR can uh, repair cars anywhere, you know, why don't we rotate a automotive repair class around to our different schools and let people participate in some other way. Let's think outside the box. And, um, but that's, a, it's, it's hard to change that program and um, because of the physical constraint. Now that said, KTEC went through a big, you know, strategic planning <coughs> process and got a lot of community feedback about the future of KTEC. And now I think, you know, it was mentioned the uh, turnover in leadership is a challenge and we've certainly been covering that through our work at Charlottesville Tomorrow. But, but I think, you know, hope, I hope there's an opportunity in the future for the community to revisit those vocational programs. And I think everyone here recognizes, you know, college is not the best choice for every student. And in fact, a lot of the people getting a good vocational education are gonna make more money than a lot of the people going to college for four years. Uh, I need to rebut that. Yeah. Uh, a certification from a vocational school is the same as a diploma from somebody's College. Yeah, no, I'm, I don't, don't take that the wrong way. I'm, 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 I'm saying there's a lot of value to that education. Right, that, that's a different type of education. Um, it's still showing that you're proficient in your skill set. We, I'm a, I agree with you. And, and our students are able to graduate with certificates. Right, exactly. Yeah. You know, a diploma is a, from, a, from a college is a certificate. That means they're proficient in what they know. Tommy, I'm sorry, but it's just that I, I have to. I, I have to agree with her. I'm a. I'm a. I'm a. I have to agree with the the the, the, the late the name. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. didn't say your name. It's frustrating when I have to reach out, looking for that specialized person to, to rebuild. Um, you know, a, you know, a vintage starter or to, to you know define you know that I need something else done. I have to go to Richmond. I have to go and search out because we're not training the people here. We have the capability to train the students here and offer a better chance. But you know you're we're squandering it, you know, and, and I feel that you know I have a hard time actually working with a lot of people. My my point was that a lot of students won't make that choice because they have to leave their comprehensive high school during part of the day to go to KTEC. Right. And so. One, one of the discussions that the board, the State Board of Education had about profile of the learner was to look at the number of requirements that in the current diploma. We've just added on over the years, we've added on, we've added on. So if you take four maths, four English, four science, four social studies, uh, three or four world languages, I'm talking about to get an advanced diploma, then you have to do some kind of, uh, of, of uh, fine arts elective to go with it. You run out of electives real quickly. So part of their discussion was how do we reduce some of uh, maybe some of the core things, do more integrated type classes. Maybe a student gets a math and a science credit for an integrated science and math class, then that frees up something for another elective to try to uh, address the, the interest of the students a little more. So that was a large part of the discussion that the State Board of Education had around building the profile of a learner was to try to get more at the things you're talking about and more about student interest and what they really are interested in. Because a lot of our kids go through high school, they don't even have time to take a photography class or take a, you know, be on the yearbook class because if I want an advanced diploma, I got to take these 40,000 classes over here and 15 AP classes so I can get into college and you know it needs to back off a little bit so kids can have more opportunities to do some of those exploratory type classes and, and that's what the discussion was about with the Board of Education. My question is about opportunity gaps and I'd be particularly interested to hear Mr. Wayne and Ms. Bowling how your answers might compare depending on the communities that you serve. Um, we hear so much about how children's opportunities 
depend too much on the zip code in which they're born. And in a place like Charlottesville, it was so compact how that plays out at a really micro level, as you were saying, where communities really change block by block. How much do you think that we can really provide meaningful equality of opportunity when where you live determines where you go, knowing everything that we do about how hard it is to actually do separate but equal well? So I'm just going to, you know, I, I know it's, it's past nine, and I see people kind of rushing this give it. So I'm going to try to make this, you know, as concise as possible. Charlottesville, you know, we're fortunate since that we 10 square miles, we can do some very unique things when all of our kids go to the same middle and high school, so it's no particular track that they go on. Some of the things that we, we do is some of our schools that might have a higher percentage of lower income um, um, students that we provide more resources to them. Something simple as, um, picture day. Um, for some schools, that's a big money maker. That's how they PTO can can do various things. Well, you know, for twenty seven dollars, you get one or two pictures. That's a lot of money. You can for that, you know, you can go and get pictures at Walmart. You can get two hundred for ten dollars. That's a small thing. It makes a, a big difference. And maybe in the springtime, that school being able to go to. Um, a field trip or something like that. So we provide a little bit more resources to those schools that, that we need to. We are trying to initiate different programs, or we have pr different programs where we have um, um, pay for their tests and provide um, extra tutoring and things like that for them. So um, for, for um, students to, so that when they take the classes, they don't feel like, well, geez, I don't have any help at home, whatever, for this. We provide help and in, in tutors for them after school. That's just a small example of some of the things that we um, have to reduce that um, opportunity gap that you were referring to. I'd say at a, at a school level too, finding out what excites a child, what, what, where their passions are, I think is something that we need. We all, I can think about classes, like when I took Algebra one. I mean, I thought math I had never been so frustrated in my life, and then all of a sudden I take Geometry, and geometry, it made sense to me. And I got an A in math for the first time um, in a long time. So me being judged by you know, the student I was as an Algebra one or even an Algebra two because I had to take it for graduation, um, I didn't have an opportunity to, to excel in that area. And I could have felt like a horrible math student for the rest of my life. But you know what, I took that um, experience of not feeling smart about something and I think I was one of the best elementary math teachers because I could figure out how to help a child understand if it was bricks or if it was blocks or if it were shoes that we would take off and count I tried to make it real for them and I think what we've got to do um, with this with an opportunity gap is figure out how to give them what they need to, to, to support the passions that they have so while we want to run after school programs, they do cost money. But we do have a lot of people that we bring into the schools. We've had um, wonderful community members that come, that we've had veterans come and talk to our children. We had an African American panel of, 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 of men who came and talked to our young African American boys and talked about the fact that if you want to do this, this is what you're going to have to do. And this is not going to be easy. And your brother may tell you not to do it, but guess what? That's not going to get you where you want to be. So we're trying to be, we're trying to fill with with some reality and some opportunities for exposure. Um, I think uh, you mentioned AVID. Um, while Greer doesn't have AVID, we actually begin kind of a fifth, fourth, fifth grade um, beginning of AVID as our children move into Jewett that has a, a an, an Albemarle High School that does have an AVID program where it may not necessarily just be thinking about opportunities for college, but they also have some funding and some other opportunities for them to, to learn more about um, different kinds of jobs that they might wanna do, um, whether it is stonework or whether it's auto mechanics. I think we are getting better in our schools of not just doing everything online, but really looking at project-based learning, trying to figure out how to bring that in. You talked about a math science connection. Why are we, why, why, will, why should we separate math from science when we actually could teach something and, and have to teach kids cook? Measure those things out, figure out what makes something boil or bake or rise, and let's find out better ways that we can meet those needs. We do need to have high expectations for our students, getting back to what you were talking about. We don't want to lower, we don't want to say, well, it's okay if you're just not quite there. We want 
kids to achieve, but we also have to realize that everyone has their strengths and their needs. So let's take those areas of strength and let's use them to support some of those areas that might be a little bit more weak. Um, more hands-on learning I think we can continue to get better at. Nothing, not everything is about technology only. Um, but really it is, I think, getting to know each and every child individually, fi figuring out what it is um, their hopes and dreams are and helping to build those. Thank you. I could talk a long, a long time about that topic. You bring a great question. Oh. <laughs> Designed from a little safe. <laughs> Do you think you could ask I, I'll, I'll shorten it greatly. I, I wanted to hear about how the different government structures come in to what actually goes on in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And maybe the, maybe in the, and I'm in, in most of New England and certainly in Rhode Island, you don't even, can't even spell county. Yes. It's all towns. Yeah, and so the Department of mm -hmm. Education becomes much more important, I think. But I'm not sure of that because I don't really know what the Department of Education does here. To tell. Um, what, who, how, who, and in what way is it going to be decided what happens to Scott, the, the Scottsville school? So that, that'll that be what, a local... How do these levels... Yeah, so in, in Virginia, uh, the local school board um, is where it's at. So uh, that, when it comes to a decision like that. So the local school board, Altamar County, so the last county. They, they will decide, yeah, it, 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 the city is completely separate. Right. So we have two of everything so around here. And it's not a town. <laughs> it's not a town. They have their own police department, fire department, I, school I department. Um, don't get me started on merging schools, because I'd love to talk about that. Um, so that's, so a local, a local, that's a local decision. The state right. doesn't have anything to do with it. Not, not with a site-based decision money, like that. Is all the money? The, the money will come. The money will flow in from the state to wherever Albemarle County says these are our schools. Okay. Right. Separate. Now, when I was on the school board, the, the the one thing I would add is when it comes to federal money, I was a school board member who said, "Why don't we opt out of federal money? Why don't we not take it so that we don't have to do all the things they want us to do? We we could take all that money, which isn't a lot in Albemarle County. Six percent. We could take a couple million dollars." So, it's not. My, my advice was let's use that money better locally. And uh, the advice I got from our superintendent was that the state um, was not going to let us get away with that. So we didn't pursue it. But we had board members as No Child Left Behind was coming in and we were having to add all these tests. We said, why are we doing this? What, what, we believe in assessments. Let's assess our students, make sure they are performing, let's eliminate the achievement gaps. But let's not be held hostage to the federal funding. Um, so it's complicated. There's federal pots of money, there's state pots of money, and there. But the biggest pot of money is right here locally. It's local, it's local dollars. Thank you. A little different in Virginia, from some other states. I think we better call it a night. I'll let it go a little late because we started late. Right? So we will see you in two weeks. The law enforcement and the criminal justice system right here. Thank you. Thank you.